Hello and welcome to Easy Projects. So in this video we will build the circuit from the previous video in the breadboard and we will uh, test it and see if it works uh, as we want it to. So just to recap we have a voltage regulating circuit here and we have a current regulating circuit over here. I will be using a current sense amplifier instead of uh, the differential amplifier that is seen here. It's the same idea it's just the current sense amplifier is made for this specific purpose. So let's get on with the testing. So I built the first part of the circuit in the breadboard here, which is the voltage regulator. I used an LM324 op amp down here, and I used a Toshiba uh, power transistor up here. It's a 2SC5200 uh, NPN transistor, and it's probably not a genuine uh, Toshiba, but uh, yeah, it works. So that's what I had laying around and it definitely looks promising so far because uh, I can keep my hand on this all day if I wanted to and right now we are at 3.3 volts and we're drawing uh, 330 milliamps so instead of the transformer and uh, bridge rectifier I just use this power supply to provide the, the power and this one as a reference the reference is going to this 10-turn uh, part here, which goes to the uh, op amp. So we can adjust the voltage, say 5 volts for example. And uh, this wire wraps around the whole shop and goes into this 10-ohm uh, resistor here. So at 5 volts we should see 500 milliamps, which we get. And I also hooked up the uh, oscilloscope and here we can see that it is a nice and stable 5 volts uh, and we can uh, adjust it. So at least this part of the circuit seems to work. And just for good measure I added a little bit of output capacitance so from the emitter of the transistor to ground and also on the reference input to the op-amp I added a capacitor and then just a big capacitor on the power rail of the op amp to smooth things out because I have fairly long cables coming from the power supply and I draw the current from the same supply so uh, this is not going to be uh, very precise so I kicked it up to 30 volts on the input here and now the transistor is starting to heat up uh, a bit at half an amp we are dissipating about 12 and a half watts now but I am curious how much current we can push out of this transistor uh, just from the op-amp because it doesn't have very high gain when it's uh, a power transistor like this one. So let's try to up the current a little bit here. Now we're up to 30 watts and it's getting pretty warm now. And we're still climbing. So it... Uh, doesn't seem to be a problem. Let's see if we can get... nope, not quite going to free amps. I don't think that's a problem with the gain of the transistor though, because uh, it's not a rail-to-rail -rail op amp, so it has um, a little bit of margin in the top. It can go all the way to ground, but not to the positive rail. And we were seeing about 25 volts here, so I think that's that's within the tolerances but in the final design I'll probably add a little bit more gain uh, just to be on the safe side so now that we know uh, this circuit is pretty much working as it should we can test the current circuit and then after that we can combine the two and see if it still works <laughs> that will be the ultimate test by the way I'm using potentiometers for now but I I plan to make this digital so you'll have a a touch screen and uh, we'll control it with a microcontroller. So I mentioned that I was worried the op amp might not be able to push enough current to the transistor to allow for free amps on the output. What I meant by that is the op amp has a maximum current output. Some op amps can deliver a couple of hundred milliamps but some op amps only a couple of tenths of milliamps so say 20-30 milliamps. I did not look up the exact figure for the one that I'm using, but let's just say it's 100 milliamps. 
a transistor is a current driven device it means that if you put a known current into the base a much larger current will go through from the collector to the emitter in case of an NPN transistor. The ratio between the base current and the collector emitter current is called the gain or the beta or HFE of the uh, transistor. There's a general rule of thumb that the smaller the transistor is, the higher the gain will be. It's not always true, but it's a good uh, rule of thumb. So something like this uh, small signal transistor will probably have a gain of 2 to 300, whereas uh, a big power transistor like this can have a gain as low as 20 maybe. Furthermore, the gain depends uh, on the current. So if you pass a very low current through them, they will have a higher gain than a large current. And to demonstrate this, we can use the transistor tester that I made in a previous video series. And uh, we turn it on, and we can read the gain in millivolts uh, on the output here. So I connected a multimeter, and we will hook up the transistor like this. And this actually has a high gain, this transistor. It's 360 almost. And that means for every milliamp you put into the base, you can uh, get 350 milliamps through the transistor. And you might notice that this value is dropping. It's because I uh, warmed this up with my hands before, and the gain is also affected by the temperature. If I just touch it again, you might see it rises. Let's just for fun try to hit it with some free spray. And you can see the gain drops dramatically. And if I just warm it up with my fingers, it goes back. But anyway, we were about to compare it to a power transistor. And you can see the gain of this one is actually pretty high. It's uh, 83. But again, these values might not be entirely accurate up at the higher currents because my transistor tester is using a base current of 10 microamps. So there will be less gain at higher currents. The minimum gain for a transistor can usually be found in the datasheet. So that's the value you want to use, not the actual tested one, because if you make a production run of something, the beta of the transistor will vary a little bit from transistor to transistor. So if we say that our op amp here could deliver a hundred milliamps and we have a transistor with a gain of 10, that means we can only get one amp flowing out of the output here, or actually 1.1 amp because we also have the base current flowing out through the output, but let's not uh, count that. What you can do to solve this problem is to add an extra transistor to the base. So you basically use a smaller transistor to drive the bigger transistor. And that way you can supply a greater current to the base of the big transistor here. So you could just do something like this, where the collectors are connected together, the base from the first transistor goes to the op amp, and then the emitter of the first transistor goes to the base of the big transistor. And if this transistor had a gain of 100, and this one had a gain of 10, you would get a total gain of 1000, meaning that the op amp should deliver very little current. Only one milliamp for every amp that you pull out of the output. So to deliver three amps, we would only require three amps to be pulled from the op amp. Of course, you would want to have some resistors here to limit the current that uh, runs into the base of the transistors. So I built up the current regulating circuit as per the schematic. And as usual with uh, these low shunt resistors, it's not easy to get it to work in a breadboard. And also the op amp is not really supposed to work <laughs> down at uh, the ground level. And we'll have some voltage drops and some resistance in the breadboard. So it, it's not easy to do in a breadboard. I had to add a, uh, a diode on the ground path just to drop the the ground or the negative rail of the op amp by about 0.6 volts uh, 
compared to the rest of the circuit. And after pretty much soldering all the ground wires together, uh, it kinda works. Uh, so I'm confident that it will work uh, once it gets onto a PCB. And I also had a little accident with that <laughs> resistor down there. But it still meshes fine, so uh, I'll just throw it out when I'm done with this. So as you can see here, if I adjust the potentiometer, we start to draw some current. I can adjust it in a few milliamp steps. And we can go up to, say, let's say 1 amp, or thereabouts. Uh, and of course now it's acting up. <laughs> so I just had a loose connection in the <laughs> breadboard. And um, what I wanted to show is, if we change the voltage, then the current doesn't change. And that's, that's the entire purpose of the current regulator, of course. Uh, there is one slight problem with this, though. And again, I think that's due to uh, it being in a breadboard. I think we will solve the problem when, when we get it onto a PCB. If we start from zero, uh, amps here, you can see the output voltage on the scope. Once we get to around uh, 2.3 amps, it starts to oscillate a little bit. Uh, it gets worse as we increase the current and then it gets better again. And when we are at 2.7 amps, it works fine again. So it's only in that region. I tried the best I could on the breadboard, but I couldn't really uh, get it any better than this. So there is a few things that I want to change. So I want to change the op amp. Right now I'm using an LM324, uh, and I'll I'll need to use something better than that. Basically, one with a lower offset input offset voltage, so that when we dial in a voltage on the DAC, we can be pretty sure we'll get that on the output as well. Of course, if the input offset is stable then we could um, calibrate it in software, but I don't want to do that. The job amps are, are not really that much more expensive. And I'll just be making a few of these power supplies, so a 10 box more here or there doesn't really matter. So at least for now we have proven that the two circuits uh, sort of kind of work. The voltage regulator worked flawlessly, and the current regulator works fine up until the 2.3 amps and then at uh, 5 amps and up to 3.5 amps it works as well and I do believe that is due to all this um, resistance in the wires contacts and very long inductive wires and we have capacitance in the breadboard as well all sorts of things that wouldn't be there on a PCB so I think this will be the end of this video uh, and if you liked it please give it the thumbs up I hope I can be ready with the next video soon, because there's still a lot of uh, choices to be made. We need to select which uh, microcontroller we want to use. I haven't decided yet, but I'm leaning towards the Arduino DUI, because it's it's pretty powerful and it's very easy to program using the uh, Arduino IDE. And also a lot of people use and are familiar with the Arduino, so it'll be easier for everybody to follow, I think. I also have uh, quite a few of these uh, embed enabled boards from NXP, Freescale and uh, also from uh, ST Microelectronics. So if you have seen my what's in the mail video, you might uh, remember that this was sent to me by Matthew. And I've actually been using these Nucleus 64 boards a lot the past year, so I want to thank Matthew for hooking me onto these, uh, if you're watching. I also used one of the Nuclear 144 uh, boards, and apart from it uh, being like this big, uh, it looks almost the same. The thing about these boards is that they are incredibly powerful uh, if you take the price into consideration. It's more powerful than the, this NXP, and this one is like 8 times more expensive. It does have Ethernet and uh, USB though. But if you buy the one of the 144 boards, it comes with Ethernet, and I think USB as well. And it's still like uh, less than a third the price of the NXP. The good thing about the embeds is that you can use the online embed compiler, and you can just uh, 
if you buy a new board you can use the exact same code almost uh, for any embed of course some embeds are missing some features uh, like these two don't have ethernet and USB uh, but I'm not sure that's supported by the embed compiler anyway I'm, I'm not sure about that but apart from that the only thing you will have to change is the pin names which you would have to do anyway uh, and then you can just use the same code you can also use the, the standalone uh, compilers from Freescale, NXP or ST and that allows you to access the registers directly and use them as just normal microcontrollers most of them have uh, support for the board anyway so you can use all the features and program them through uh, the debugger and also debug them so you can get these Nucleo 64 boards for around fifteen dollars and they have uh, as the name suggests 64 uh, IO pins and they all come with a built-in debugger that you can snap off uh, when you've finished your development if you want to but you can also leave it in uh, the debug also serves as a programmer of course and you just took in uh, mini USB and you're good to go of course there's a catch <laughs> that's always a catch of course and it is that there's not as much support uh, and uh, programs available that you can just download as there is for the Arduino so yeah the other catch is that I want to use an LCD screen uh, and a touch screen and I know that there is a library available for the Arduino and I'm not sure if there is for the embed so if there is no for the embed then I'll just use the Arduino because I don't want to write that myself uh, it takes too much time so I bought a few different screens as you can see I don't remember the size of this one but it's you know not that big I think this will be too small uh, I was thinking about using this one which I think is 3.2 inches I'm not sure it might say on the back. Nope. I think this might be okay in size. You can have a reasonably sized font and you can have some buttons for pressing. And when you put up a keypad, you have enough space that you will you won't miss the key and hit a different one. I also got a seven inch one, but I think uh yeah it would be nice, but it's a little expensive, so I think I'll I'll be using it for something different. Of course, if you have any ideas, you're <laughs> welcome to post them down in the comments. Uh, so, yeah, again, thanks for watching this video, and uh, I hope to see you in the next one. See you.